welcome to Board Games with Niramas and today it's time for a top 10 games of 2016 and I've been doing this a bit different than most maybe because I haven't played all the games of course that I would like to play from 2016 so therefore this is going to be two videos so this first one I'm going to have a top 10 of the games that I actually played and I enjoyed and I will also like to point out that I'm I don't make reviews normally, but so these games are the top 10 games that I enjoy to play and that I want to play soon again. It's not necessarily the best games in regards to components or the mechanic is so good and so on. It's more of uh, I had fun playing them, I want to play them again. And so to start off, um, we're going to do this list and then the next one is going to be the top 10 games of 2016 that I want to play that I haven't played yet because I haven't been able to get all the games that I wanted from this year uh, for different reasons. So let's start off with just some honorable mentions. Now it, I'm not going to go into expansions on this list except for mentioning uh, Seven Wonders Duel, Pantheon of course. Uh, this is my favorite expansion of the year. So good, so good expansion. I can't recommend it uh, enough for people who like Seven Wonders Duel. And I'm, it also changes the gameplay a bit. So really good expansion and also Star Wars Imper Imperial Assault all of you fans out there uh, Best in Gambit came out this year awesome expansion uh, it introduces some new mechanics to the game that's really interesting and it's sort of uh, some new heroes uh, new mini campaign of course uh, I can really recommend this one as well but enough of that let's get to my number 10 game of 2016 <laughs> But it's, it's a, a uh, past tile laying game. So there's two different ways to play it. You could play it in uh, real time. So each player, uh, you have this chaos where everybody's trying to grab the bag and get this tile. You have two tiles, you have one in each hand, and you have to place them. Uh, if you can't place them, you can place them in front of you. You have like a storage for tiles, but it fills up and then you can't pull another tile from the bag. You can grab other people's tile from their storage. And so you're at the same time you're trying to, let's say that uh, there's four different elements. So I'm going for water, for example. I'm trying to place these water tiles and also put my priests on the water tiles, sort of like Carcassonne when you put the meeple out, uh, because you want a big area uh, to score at the end of the game. It's really chaotic, and I had so much fun playing this. Uh, we've been laughing a lot, and so I didn't think I was going to like it at all because it didn't sound like a I don't know, I, I'm not a fan of these uh, real-time games where you have to fast play stuff, you know. I like to think and plan ahead and so on. But uh, this one surprised me a bit, uh, so my number 10 is Four Gods. Right, so my number 9 of 2016 is Stronghold 2nd Edition. and. I might be cheating here a bit because it's a second edition, it's a um, reprint of a game, but I haven't played the first one, so Stronghold second edition, uh, two player game, it's uh, sort of a big battle going on, like the Battle of Helm's Deep almost, You're, one guy is defender, and you have all these kind of different ways you can build your walls up, you can increase your uh, armies and so on, uh, but you have a limited number of defenders, so you gotta be careful not to lose them. I mean, so if you if they get shot down, they could go to the hospital and then you get them back the next round. But if too many of them get wounded at the same time, then they're gone forever. So and the attacker has a number of different ways to attack the castle. They, they have these uh, trebuchets and uh, catapults and uh, this horde, never-ending <laughs> horde of of uh, ogres and uh, trolls and goblins and just pouring them onto the castle so this game is really fun for two players it's a quite a massive two player game this could take uh, quite some time and there's a lot of thinking a lot of planning and strategic thinking so that's my number nine game of 2016 stronghold second edition <laughs> Uh, 
And so it's time for my number 8 game of the year, and it's Oracle of Delphi from Steffenfeld. Uh, this came out at Essen this year, and I was really looking forward to this one. Now, I've played it a bit. Uh, I like it still, I do, but it's, uh, it's a racing game, and you can really start to go into the AP, uh, <laughs> AP area with this one. Because you have to plan ahead and use your dice, uh, which is a really nice system. It's kind of like Castle of Burgundy combined with Trajan almost. So you have this uh, rondelle, but you have dice that you throw. And then depending on what you roll, you're going to get to do different things. But you can also convert them um, into another symbol or color. And then you're going to use them to move around and so on. I really like it. It's a racing game, of course. Uh, I said that, uh, but it's. I I found that in all the games I played, it comes down to a really exciting end. That's one of the things I really like about this game. That it could look like someone's really pulling ahead, but then all of a sudden uh, another player catches up, and it gets really exciting at the end. So that's my number eight game of the year: Oracle of Delphi. For my number 7 of 2016, it's Nine Worlds. This game, uh, which is sort of a... it looks really basic. Uh, I don't own it, so I don't have it here, but it's... it's you have these little markers, little stones that in different colors, player colors, that you're moving around and you can get more of them into the board. You can throw the other player stones around and so on. Uh, it's really tactical. It's almost, I would say, an abstract game, a strategy game. But then at the same time, there's a—I mean—it's a Viking theme with with the the gods from the uh, Viking area. So there's sort of some you have some spe you get some special power for controlling different areas, and with that special power, you can banish another player's stone to hell, uh, and then he has to get it back, or else he would get minus points. It's really strategic and it's quite chaotic as well. I play this with with five players and uh, it goes up to six players actually. But with five players, it was kind of like I did something and then I was just hoping that nobody else was noticing. Because if someone pulls ahead and starts to get the lead, then everyone else is going to target them. So you have to be careful. I, I almost had the same feeling with this game that you get in the old Risk or in uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, you know... The sort of battle feeling where everybody's targeting the, the leader and then the balance shifts back and forth. Uh, really nice game, really exciting and a lot of fun I had with this game. I really want to play it again. I think it's one of those games that you have to play a number of times before you start to really see the strategic patterns in it. So uh, that's my number seven game, Nine Worlds. So, for my number 6 game of the year is Mystic Veil. Vale. Mystic Veil vale is a, uh, well, they have this new mechanic that's called card crafting. So, I, I think it's only Mystic Veil vale that has it so far, but it's really nice. Instead of a deck building game where you purchase cards and increase your deck to make it better, we, each player starts with 20 cards in Mystic Veil vale and you only have those 20 cards and then you're going to improve the cards themselves by... Uh, the cards are sleeved so you're going to purchase these plastic cards that you can put in the sleeve and so you can have three different levels of effects on them on each card and I mean in, in all aspects it works like the deck builder you, you get this mana that it's sort of your uh, currency that you purchase new cards for and you have the symbols that you can purchase veil cards which is sort of bonus cards where you can get extra points or you can get special effects and you just build your deck and also it has a really nice um, push your luck element so every time it's your turn you're going to draw cards and you, you can stop you have to stop at a certain when you get uh, enough corruption symbols it's called when you get 
three of those you stop but then you can push your luck and try to get another card that's not a corruption symbol on in order to get more mana and, and other symbols that can help you or get more points and so on. So it's quite an uh, exciting factor of a game. I really like push your luck elements in games. And sometimes, you know, if you see that you're far behind, you're trying to pull ahead, then you can do the... You can take a bit of risk, but you can also uh, benefit from it. So Mystic Veil vale is a really fun game, and I also have the expansion for it, the Veil vale of Magic it's called. And so it's actually in the box because it just adds more cards. Uh, it's that kind of expansion that just it doesn't change anything in the game mechanic. So this case is a game that I would highly recommend, and I really like it because I play mostly board games. I would say, or you know, the whole classical board and all that with the with the figures. Uh, this one is just cards, so it's a nice change for me as well. So that's my number 6 of 2016, Mystic Veil. Vale. And so it's time for my number 5. And my number 5 of 2016 is your week. Now my box is a bit smashed up from uh, dropping it. Uh, but this game is so much fun. It's actually a uh, retheme of a. Uh, it's Stefan Feld, and it's, it's a retheme of his uh, Spearstadt game that came out a few years ago. Uh, so it's exactly the same game, but with, with different uh, themes. So this is a Viking theme. I like that more than the sort of German uh, trading um, thing. And so in your week, you're. It's sort of an auction game. That's the whole uh, base mechanic of it. You're going to get different cards out that you can purchase. They have different effects. They have warriors that can fight when you need to fight and so on. And so you get these resource cubes that you can use to make offerings to the gods to get points. You can sell them for coins and, and you can also uh, put them into the tradesman's uh, use so they give you points at the end of the game. But in order to get all of these cards you have to do the bidding phase uh, where and it's a really nice system where if Draco wants a card, then he's going to bid for it by putting his Viking there, sort of meeple. Then, if I also want that card, I can stand in line behind Draco, and then all of a sudden that card costs him two silver instead of one, which it would be if it's only one, if it's only him being there. So, by sort of, I can increase the price for another player, even if I don't want the card. It's quite mean game actually this. It's, it's a lot meaner than I usually uh, prefer in games. But, and so if I want to get the card really bad, I can even sort of put my guy there to make it too expensive for Draco to buy the card. But then when he pulls out because he can't afford it or it's too expensive for him, then it gets cheaper for me. So it's, it's a nice way of uh, doing auctions in a game. And uh, I really enjoy this one. I uh, really want to play it more. I I think this one really you should really be, I think four or five players. Uh, it's not a really, it's not a two player game like most auction games are of course, and I think even with three it's a bit too. Uh, I don't know four or five players is what I recommend this for, and I really recommend this game. This is so much fun, and that's why it's my number five of two thousand sixteen. Your week. So it's time for my number four of 2016 and it's Saloon Tycoon. Uh, now this game is so much fun. It's um, it's sort of a building game. You build your saloon, you're trying to compete with other saloon owners of course, uh, to make the best one and to lure the uh, citizens of this little western town that you're in to come to your saloon and give you benefits and points. Um, the really nice thing about this game is it's it's quite mean. It's quite uh, take that moments. I play a card and I can steal gold from the other players and so on. Uh, but it's it's so nice because you're building. I like building in games. And in this game, you build your saloon, but you uh, you have these tiles of different sizes. But you're actually building them not just outwards, but all also upwards. 
So we get a 3D, you put in these little pillars and then you start building your saloon so you can have three floors and a roof on top of it. So it's, it's really uh, nice with these little fiddly things and the, the component quality are really good. It's really solid uh, cardboard and so on. And the gold pieces are sort of uh, asymmetrical plastic pieces, really nice, look like gold nuggets. So this game I had a lot of fun with and uh, I actually played it today and I got really badly beaten in it. Uh, you can, I mean, in one way you could say this game is not that good because you could really come in behind, it's hard to catch up, there's no real good catch up me mechanic in it. But I, I, it's, so, it's just so much fun. I love the theme. I like Western games. I like the Western team. And it's sort of also a game where you you get, to, at the start of each uh, game, you get four uh, objective cards that are secret to the other players. And you get to choose two of them and return two of them, the other, to the box. So you can sort of form your strategy from the beginning and sort of have plan ahead and, and uh, make a plan for how you're going to play this game. Because it's quite fast, you can play it in an hour or so. So you can play a few games uh, in a row. I like to do that in one evening. So, um, really fun game. I can really recommend it. And that's why it's my number four, Saloon Tycoon. So we're up to number three, and this is quite a heavy box. <laughs> and my number three for 2016 is Mansion of Madness, second edition. Again, this is the second edition. It's a reprint, of course, but this one is quite unique because uh, it changes the game a lot from the first edition. This one uh, requires an app. I think most of you watching have already heard about this. Uh, it's been so much buzz about this game. And rightly so, because it's a really good game. Uh, you have this app, uh, you can use your phone or uh, an iPad and so on. Uh, actually, last day I've been playing this with some friends and we had a, a TV with the iPhone connected to the TV. So we had a TV screen up so everybody could see the uh, board. And I really like this game where you, you're exploring. So. You start off, let's say you're in this house you're entering with your uh, investigator, you have these pl really nice plastic figures. And so when you open the door, then the app tells you that, okay, now you're entering a kitchen and then you're going to pull out the kitchen uh, cardboard tile, really nice quality as well. And then you're gonna put it out and then inside the kitchen, maybe there's some clues you have to investigate. Maybe there's some painting you need to look at, or there could be a monster showing up and you have to fight it. And I really like, I mean, I like the Lovecraft, the Cthulhu universe as well. So this game is just amazing for me. And you can even play it solo. I play it a bit solo as well. I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, you don't really get, I mean, even if you have the app and all that, you don't really get the feeling that it's a uh, computer game or a digital game. Because you're still playing on the board. You're still using these uh, figures and, and these tiles and so on. You still have cards that you draw. If you cast a spell, you draw. You have the card that you flip and look what happens after you cast a spell. Did you, uh, did it affect you in some way? Even if you did damage to your opponent, maybe you also got damaged by a fireball or whatever it was. So uh, this game is just amazing, and I can really recommend it. That's why it's my number three of 2016, Mansion of Madness Second Edition. And so it's time for my number two of 2016, and it's the Networks. Now with this game, uh, I haven't, I, I, I didn't know anything about this game until Essen, and a friend got it, and uh, this game is just so much fun. I mean, basically you're you're building a network station, TV network, so you have to purchase shows that you're going to put at different like seven, eight, and nine, or eight and nine and ten p.m. Some shows really need to be at a certain time to, to get the most viewers. And then you can attach a commercial to the show. Uh, that you, and then you can also put in a star. So you can have a star, uh, you know, a host for the TV show. Uh, there's different categories, of course. It's the sitcoms and sport and so on. 
Uh, they made it so much fun because, I mean, in the game itself, the, the whole game is, is solid. Um, it's sort of a... Well, you plan ahead and you're trying to, well, if I buy that star, then I could get that show, I can put it there, I get so much that and that many viewers. Uh, the viewers are sort of like points in the end. Um, and you also need to care about your income, you have to get money so you can purchase new shows and the commercials and so on. Uh, but they they did it so much fun. I mean, this graphic and uh, they made they made all these shows have names to sort of um, refer to or a, a joke about the real shows. For example, instead of instead of lost, you have found. That's a show here. Um, there's also a show called uh, um, How I Left Your Father <laughs> instead of How I Met Your Mother. It's so much fun. We were laughing a lot playing this, and I mean, I haven't even seen all the cards yet, of course, so uh, there's a lot of fun in this, and it, I mean, it's not just a fun, you know, it's not like a party game, it's, it's just a real solid game mechanic where you, uh, economical game, I would say, in a way, you have to plan and so on, but uh, then it's also the theme and the uh, how they made it with the graphics and all that is so much fun. So that's why it's my number two game of the year, The Networks. So we came to the uh, my number one for 2016. It's a game I don't even have right now, which is a bit sad. I but. I, I pre-ordered it or sort of for the second printing, but of course I have to say what it is as well. Terraforming Mars is my number one game of 2016. This game, uh, not because it's designed by a Swede and a Swedish company uh, published it, but uh, it's a bit of fun for me as well. But the game is so much fun and it's so solid. Uh, you have these cards and all the cards are unique, you have 260 different cards. and you have different actions on your turn, you can play the cards, you can, you're going to terraform Mars, so you're going to make it a livable place for humans. So you're playing these cards that sort of it could be a comet coming that would raise the temperature, but maybe it will destroy some plants that uh, someone started building and so on. There's, there's some aggressive cards in there, which I don't mind in this game because it's not that much of it. And this, there's a real engine building. You you sort of you start off feeling like, well, I can't do almost anything on my turn. But then a few rounds later, you're doing a lot of things, and the engine just keeps building, and you get more and more income and different. Uh, you can get metals and so on. You put out plants and and start greeneries on the surface of Mars, which will increase the oxygen level. But then if the oxygen level goes up too much, then perhaps some of the cards you have you can't play anymore because they require the oxygen level to be low. Uh, it's so good. And, and you also have this, you have this uh, ending which varies because the, the game goes over generations, which are sort of rounds. But it doesn't end at a certain round. It ends when Mars has enough water and, and oxygen and and uh, heat when the temperature is, is eight degrees and uh, sort of you can live there so yeah and that's that's a really nice uh, scaling function as well because if you're playing it with three players uh, or if you're playing it with five players the game is sort of the same length anyway because uh, if with five players it's going to be more players that are affecting Mars and affecting the temperature and oxygen level so it's going to end, well not quicker, but it's going to end at sort of the same time as if you were three players. And I, I heard this game got some critics because of, there's some random elements, because we have the card drawing, so there's always the luck of the draw. Some player could get a good card, uh, or some good cards that worked well together, and another player is sitting there and we're just bad cards that don't work well together. But, I mean, in the end, it's going to even out, because you're going to get, during the game, you're going to be able to get a lot of different cards. You're going to purchase cards at the start of each round. You're going to be, be able to purchase the cards that you want. So you can plan also for this sort of uh, engine building and how you want the cards to work with each other. So I don't see that as a, such a big of a problem. And, I mean, I had so much fun playing this game. It's It's so... It's not the kind of fun where I sit and laugh, like with the networks, it's, it's a lot of laughing. 
uh, Terraforming Mars is more like I really get a sense of achievement. I really feel like my, I, I built an engine. It's really working. I can, I'm improving. I'm actually making a, a, an impact on Mars. My company uh, sort of, or, or my effort is really making a difference for, for, the, for the place and for the, for the possibility of people living there. So uh, Terraforming Mars, my number one game for the year. And I, I, I haven't played all the games that I want to play, of course, during 2016. But I don't think any game is going to beat this one. We'll see. Uh, but I, I doubt it. So that was my top 10 games of 2016. And in a few days, you're going to be able to see the top 10 games of 2016 that I want to play that I haven't played. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of them, of course, a lot of them. But uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's a few games that I really look forward to play, I really want to play. And um, some of them I pre-ordered and so on. Uh, they, they get out of, you know, they were out of sale uh, because they were really popular. And uh, yeah, so that was it for this list. And uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it. And as always, I'm going to ask you to go down there, click the red button to subscribe to the channel. Uh, like the video, you know, Draco wants you to like the video as well, and uh, tell your friends about it. And also, uh, of course, tell me, what's your top 10 games of the year? Uh, put it down in the comments section and we can have a discussion. I mean, there's probably some game that you're thinking, why didn't he mention that? Why is it not on his list? But perhaps I didn't play it, perhaps it's not my type of game, and, um, you know, Tell me what's your favorite game of the year, what game should I have had on this list, and what game should I really check out. So help me out in, in improving my, my game awareness, and we can help each other out, we can have a discussion in the comment section. So thank you for watching, and I hope you have a nice evening or morning or whatever you're watching this. Take care, bye bye.